This is lecture six, space requirements and layout, part number one. And this is the lecture for IE 4355 facilities planning. As we do every time, we start the lecture with course objectives. So in this particular lecture, we're gonna be uh, focusing on that last course objective, which is to be able to design layouts, incorporating product process and personal requirements. So as mentioned in the first slide, uh, this lecture is divided in two parts. So in the first part, we're gonna look at the introduction to this topic, and then we are gonna talk about structural system performance, enclosure systems, and atmospheric systems. In lecture number two, we're gonna discuss, or part two of this lecture, we're going to discuss the electrical and lighting systems, the life safety systems. The learning objectives for this lecture is to provide an overview of how the systems elements impact the overall process of facilities planning. We also want to provide an understanding of the various systems elements within the facility, not to prepare the facilities plan to design a structure or its heating, ventilation, and air conditioner or other systems, but we, we, we need to have an understanding of how those decisions are made in terms of the, um, the capabilities of those systems for a facility. So, so let's start with the introduction. Um, so as we have discussed uh, during the first part of this semester, uh, the most difficult determination in facilities planning is the amount of space required in the facility. There's some uncertainty generally existing in concerning the impact of technology, uh, a changing product mix, a changing demand levels, and organizational designs for the future. So these four areas create some uncertainty in terms of what will be needed and how would that impact our design for, for the facility. The facilities planner then has the difficult task of projecting through space requirement for the uncertain future. In, in this slide, we have the workstation specification. This is a slide coming from one of the previous lectures. And here we're showing some of the requirements for the design of a workstation for a single employee. And as you can see, um, for a single workstation, there's a, there's a need for, for a lot of space in this particular case. Uh, we have we need the space for the the area where the the staff will be working and some additional space for for storing materials and obviously if you're if you're using if this station requires machine then a majority of the space will be allocated for that machine so the department specification builds on on top of the individual workstation space so as after you have defined the, the requirements for each individual workstation for a particular area then we have to define uh, the space for each department so once the space requirements for individual workstations have been determined the space requirements for each department can be established So the responsibility of the facilities planner is specifying what systems are required and where. We're integrating those systems into the facility. So the facilities planner must be aware that the cost of constructing, operating, and maintaining the facility is 
significantly impacted by the facility systems. A critical factor affecting facilities flexibility is the facility systems. A facilities plan is not complete until all systems are specified. Facility systems have an important impact on employee performance, morale, and safety. And facility systems have an important impact on the fire protection, maintenance, and security of a facility. So what are the facility systems considered in this lecture? Those are listed next. So those uh, facility systems are the structural systems, the atmospheric systems, the enclosure systems, the lighting and electrical systems, and also the light safety systems. So let's talk about the structural system performance. So again, as we stated at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the plan is not for you to become an, a civil engineer and on, know how to build a, a building, but uh, the idea is for you to understand how those systems are defined so you can understand how those impact the design of the facility and the layout of the facility. So the most common structural types of for industrial facilities are the steel skeleton frame or reinforced concrete skeleton frame. And this is in terms of column spacing. Column configuration will impact the layout and the layout will affect the structural design. So again, um, when you maybe when you start designing a, a facility layout, the building is still not there. So as you design the, the interior of the facility, the building might be under construction. So it is important for you to understand where those columns are located because those can have an impact on when you're placing a, a department or where you're placing a machine and so on. So the facilities planner must insist that the structural grid spacing optimize the function of the facility. So for example, in a warehouse, the column spacing should be dictated by the rack dimensions and the access aisles between the racks. Design for requirement. So a common error in designing warehousing facilities is using building cost criteria to define column spacing and determine the grid configuration. That's a major error. Uh, so those decisions should not be uh, drive by co cost. Uh, in terms of the types of columns, heavy wall, uh, round or square tubular columns should be used in warehouses. These are a little bit more expensive than h beam but provide much better facility in the long run. Also, Eliminate rotting and vermin nesting places. Ensure heavy maintenance and cleanliness. Provide the ability to place uh, downspouts within the columns and minimize the effects of denting column strength. And also eliminate the corners that can pull packages from pallets when the forklift truck operator move too close to the column. The next topic is uh, the enclosure system. The enclosure system provides a barrier against the effects of extreme cold or heat. Lateral forces like the wind, water, and on this undesirable entries like humans and insects. So humans in the sense of people not allowed into the facility. The enclosure elements are floor, walls, and the roof. 
All three elements are intended to provide a facility with a specified comfort level and is often impacted by the thermal performance of the building enclosure. So the following generalization holds true. The building enclosure plus the service input is equal to the comfort. In terms of thermal performance, thermal performance is usually required to rectify the heat transmission imbalance between inside and outside areas of the enclosure. So the, in here, the climate is a major determinant. One of the major problems in thermal performance, therefore, is how to make effective use of the solar gain. And this is becoming very popular um, for multiple facilities that are moving to uh, the design of buildings that are green. So how do we make the best use of this solar gain? Solar transmission is effectively controlled. If effectively controlled, can significantly reduce the building's dependence on artificial atmospheric systems, such as the HVAC systems. So here we have some examples on, on the impact of the, um, the solar irradiance on the facility. So we have here um, a single glaze clear. Uh, so we are talking about different type of, of material. So, um, so for the one at the top, we have the single glaze clear, 90% uh, of the incident solar rails are transmitted due to the poor absorption and reflection qualities of the single glaze element. A double pane configuration with a heat absorbing element reduces the amount of transmission from 90% to 45%. And solar gain can be reduced additionally from 90 to 25% if a reflected glass member is substituted for a heat absorbing member in the double pane configuration. So this is uh, the difference. Um, if you use, use a single glaze clear material, you see that 90% um, of it is transmitted, only 10% will be reflected. If you use a single glaze clear, um, so you are getting 45% into the, the inside of the facility, and here you have 25% uh, in off solar gain. Very performance. The material selected, metal, plastic, or maestrine cladding, should be more impervious to penetration. Thermal performance coupled with water exclusion forms the backbone of most enclosure systems. There are two areas of consideration, above the ground and below the ground. Above the ground, facilities planners must be aware of the problems that a poorly designed roof can cause. The primary performance needs of the roof is water exclusion, um, vapor migration, good insulation, and water barrier on removal are essential to an effective roofing system. An alternative is the green roof. Some of the advantages are reducing heating and cooling requirements, protection of roof components from UV rays, dealing with wind and temperature fluctuations, and reducing the site's impervious surface, thus allowing for more parking in large buildings for the same site. So if you can use your, your roof to provide some of the green areas that are needed for, for every um, building, then you can use some of that space to, in, to increase the size of the building. Uh, so that's what we mean by that last bullet. And uh, here I have some examples of how that technology works. 
Um, so again, he has multiple advantages. So you can have a, almost like a, a, a park if you have a large building on top in your roof. Uh, ground and below ground. So in terms of enclosure system, the ground and below ground condition from industrial facilities is typically a concrete slab sitting directly on the ground. The primary concerns with ground conditions are water penetration and vapor migration. So in this slide, um, this picture, we're showing a, a concrete slab. Um, so if you have seen new construction or for homes, typically this is what you're gonna see on the floor before they, they put the, the, the concrete for the, for the floor. Floor performance in most manufacturing and warehouses facilities. The floor is second only to the roofing performance requirements. Over time, concrete slab floors tend to uh, crack dust and generally deteriorate. Some tips for preventing some of these conditions are as follows. Uh, steel fiber mixed into the concrete will not prevent cracks, but will reduce the width of cracks once they occur. And synthetic fibers mix into the concrete to reduce segregation of the concrete mixtures as it dries. And the four helps to reduce the formation of shrinkage cracks. So those are two options for preventing these cracks on the floor. So, um, so I'm gonna stop here and on the next video, we are gonna continue the discussion of space requirements and layout, which is lecture six, part one. So on the second part of this video, we are going to discuss atmospheric systems.